from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome to Face the State. I'm John Shearer and today I'm joined by Cam Shawley, who's the new superintendent at Yellowstone National Park. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for Appreciate having you. you here today. So was this an expected job for you? I mean, was this something you were trying for? Did this come out of the blue? How, how'd you get back here to Yellowstone? How do I know you're gonna ask that question? <laughs> uh, it, it was unexpected, uh, but it is a privilege to be here. And uh, you know, Yellowstone is an icon that's known not only nationally, but worldwide. And uh, the team here, the partners, uh, the park, is just a, it's, a, it's incredible to be here as a superintendent. Uh, wasn't something that I envisioned. Uh, was enjoying my previous job in Omaha as the regional director of the Midwest region. Fantastic team there. Uh, fantastic group of parks. Um, so unexpected, but uh, it's great to be here. And you have some history here. I do. You went to high school down here in Gardner, right? Proud, a proud Gardner graduate. Tell me some stories about that. Well, I moved here about halfway through my junior year, and actually the the high school in Gardner had burned down in 1985, 84, 85, I think. And so our high school uh, during the rebuild was moved up to the YCC camp up, up here above Mammoth. Oh. And so for my high school, um, the Gardner High School was actually in the park uh, for the better part, for all of 1986 and most of 87. So you literally went to high school in the park? In Mammoth, right. In fact, our, in our rec hall over here is, was our gym. And so uh, it's been interesting being back and, uh, you know, some, some great folks, uh, many of whom are on the team here in Yellowstone that uh, went to Gardner High School that, that I know from, from the 80s. It's been great to reconnect with them. And uh, the community's changed some, but it's still... Uh, an incredible place and with incredible people and uh, it's good to be back. Let's come back and talk a little bit more about that uh, a little later but uh, I guess there's some business that we want to get to first. Okay. Um, let's start with the shutdown because that had had a big impact on the park. It came early in the season when you're normally doing hiring um, you know for those seasonal jobs. How, how are you doing it? Have you been able to catch up on that? So we have a great HR team uh, we have, you know, the shutdown's unfortunate, but uh, I was really impressed with uh, not only the Park Service team uh, who ran the park during the shutdown, uh, but our partners who helped us do that, like Zantera, our concessioners, uh, the communities really stepped up and, and helped um, and really allowed us to maintain uh, as much of an open operation as possible. Uh, and. The next part of that is once the government shut down or was over with, to your question, uh, looking at what types of impacts that 30, 35 days had on our ability to prepare for summer operations. Uh, we've got a great HR team and they've really accelerated uh, hiring. I think we're on track. Uh, roads crews got right back to work. Uh, we're on schedule as far as opening uh, the roads in the interior. Uh, so really, I don't, there might be some things here and there, but generally speaking, we didn't miss a beat coming out of the, out of the shutdown, and that's due to uh, the fantastic team here in this park and getting us ready for this busy season coming up. Now, during the shutdown, you had to dip into some of the recreation fee funds, maybe for the last two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. um, how much were those funds depleted here? So it's, so depleted is probably not the right word, I would say, uh, first of all, we take in about $15 million in, in, fee, in fees every year in this park. Um, obviously, we have, about a, we have about a $36 million operating budget. We have funds that come in from, for transportation from, from other fund sources, but from a, a fee a revenue perspective, we take in about $15 million. We retain about $11 million of that uh, here in the park. We spent in, that 22, in about a 22-day period uh, roughly 375000 of, of that. Um, what people don't understand about uh, how the fee dollars were used is that there's three, well, there's three things that I was focused on with, with the shutdown and that we care about across the, across the service. Number one is the protection of the resources of this park. Um, that, that is paramount. Number two for me is the welfare of our employees, including trying to get them paid. 
and, and three, concurrently, is, is reducing um, any negative economic impacts on surrounding local communities. The use of the fee dollars allowed us to achieve all three of those. Now, we didn't run the full park operation on fees, um, but there are certain functions that are allowable under, under um, legislation um, and are appropriate for us to use in fees. Uh, but the 375000 that we used, once the appropriation bill passed, we got that money back. So now we got it back in the form of appropriated dollars that we would have spent otherwise during the shutdown. But we didn't actually lose $375,000. And so I think it's an important point for people to understand that uh, in this case, there, there wasn't uh, like a permanent depletion of 375. The only lost rev, and I don't, I don't say only, but the lost revenue that we did have uh, was about 90,000 we would have collected at the gates during January. Now, January is one of our lightest months. Um, so if you're gonna have a shutdown in, in a park, Yellowstone, you know, 29,000 visitors in January normally versus, you know, almost a million a month in the summer. Um, in the summer, in the winter, because of, of winter use, you know, we have permitted access to the backcountry. Uh, so we have, we had an ability, you know, this road between Gardner and Cook City would have remained open anyway. Uh, we had an ability, I think, in this part to, to utilize the flexibility that was given to us with the fee funding to get some employees paid, get more staff on, keep the bathrooms clean, contribute more successfully with our partners to accomplish those goals. And I, I think it was a good decision. So you're talking about, a, in relative terms, a small amount of money. I don't want to call $90,000 a small amount. But um, So do you even worry about trying to replenish that, or you just kind of roll right along? Well, there's no way to replenish that. Uh, but we didn't, we're not missing a beat in relationship to anything we were going to do with, with our fee funding. I mean, yes, you could say, well, you're doing $90,000 less. You have $90,000 less fl uh, flexibility mm -hmm. in those funds. But we, you know, last year we spent almost $120 million in this park. Um, I take 90000 very seriously. But in relationship to, you know, the, the, some of those factors were out of our control, obviously, here, uh, we did a good job of minimizing um, the impacts to the greatest degree possible on the resources, on our employees, and on our communities. I guess the next place to go to from there is infrastructure needs, because those, those fees are used in part toward infrastructure in the park. Mm -hmm. And I know all parks around the country are fighting an infrastructure battle, and Yellowstone's one of them. What do you see as your top priorities for infrastructure here? So our number right now in deferred maintenance is about 580 million in deferred maintenance in this park. Uh, I believe that number is higher than 580 million um, for a variety of different reasons. How much higher? I, I won't guess at, that, at, at this point, mm -hmm. but I, I think there's, uh, one of the things we're working on uh, right now is ensuring that the information we have in our systems is as accurate as possible so that we can convey uh, the right number to the public, uh, to Congress, um, and that we've got a plan to prioritize projects from different fund sources uh, appropriately. Now, a lot of that deferred maintenance is in, uh, I mean, about half of that's in roads and bridges. You know, we have over 400 miles of, of roads in this park. Uh, so that's a big part of that price tag. But we also have an incredible number of structures. Um, you're here in Fort Yellowstone right now today. Um, you know, the, the history in this place is pretty incredible. Uh, but there's a lot of very high value, high asset, or um, in our asset portfolio of cultural and historic resources that really need to be uh, maintained and looked at. Uh, if you're asking me what my highest priority within the DM, um, you know, it's it's probably not one single priority area. It's it's really looking at the resources and the assets that are in the worst condition. Uh, and those can be wastewater treatment facilities, they can be roads and bridges that need attention, uh, they can be employee housing, they can be historic resources. And looking at the funds that we have available over certain time horizons to ensure that we're making the right investments and the right resources. And especially in cases like historic resources, like I mentioned here, you know, our inability to actually put the right level of investment into those structures um, prohibits us from meeting our mission mandate of protecting cultural, preserving cultural mm -hmm. and historic resources. And so it's important that we're organized and there's a huge business acumen component to that. And um, we'll work through that. I think that number is higher than 580. 
Um, but uh, we'll let you know as soon as we know uh, a better number there. Mm -hmm. Another part of, of the infrastructure improvements that we need to make is, is uh, a high priority that we're focused on is employee housing. And uh, we're rolling out a set of strategic priorities uh, for the park. They're in draft form. We'll be releasing them publicly here shortly. Uh, but the, the, the first of the five big buckets is called what, what I call focusing on the core. And, you know, we can talk all day long about protecting the resources in this park, managing visitor use, uh, partnering with communities. But if, if the core team in this park uh, isn't well taken care of, uh, if we don't have the right business acumen platforms established, if we don't have the right organization for them to work in, we cannot accomplish as efficiently as we should many of those other priorities that we want to, to execute on. And so uh, in that core priority really is, uh, first and foremost for me is employee housing. Mm -hmm. you know, we've got 450 housing units in this park. Um, many of those are in very isolated sections. And we've done well in some areas of housing. Uh, we've got some great teams in the park that do their best they can to improve employee housing, but we've got some housing that's just abysmal. It's an embarrassment. We've got employees, especially some of our seasonal employees who live in trailers, trailers with mold, trailers that uh, need to be replaced uh, immediately. Um, and so we'll be focused on a couple things <clears throat> on that front. One is doing everything we can to invest dollars into improving existing employee housing. You know, a huge part of our success in recruiting good talent is having good housing options. And that's not just for the park service, it's for the concessioner, it's for the businesses in Gardner, you know, or the Gateway Communities, West Yellowstone, Cody, et cetera. And so it's a common problem and it's getting um, more complex as time goes on for a variety of different reasons. But we'll be focused internally on putting investments into improving employee housing. Second to that is where do we have gaps and where we need new housing based on staffing configurations in parts of the park. So we might want to, you know, take out trailers and replace them. The Department of Interior has been extremely supportive, as has the Park Service in Denver and Washington, in helping us prepare a five-year plan for getting rid of about 75 obsolete trailers that are being used as housing and getting those replaced with new housing. We'll be doing that over the next five years. And then the third part of that is really what are some options and partnering we can do with the, with the communities where we might be, be able to do some joint housing development um, outside of the boundaries perhaps with cooperative agreements where maybe developers come in and we're able through existing authorities to, to rent some of those, those properties, those, those types of things. And so those are kind of three areas in housing that are, are really important to me. And uh, giving employees choices, making their homes in the parks, you know, we're their landlord, but they, they, they're paying rent and uh, quite frankly, some of the places that I've seen, we should be paying them to live in, <laughs> uh, quite frankly. So we need to do um, a better job on that front, we will. And so then that, that gets into other, other improvements that we want to make with you know, workplace improvements, um, culture change, team cohesion, uh, all of those areas, tethered to are we managing our finances most effectively? And that's also connected to are we organized properly, both programmatic and operationally? And we've got great people in this park. I mean, some of the best I've seen. Um, how we communicate, how we share resources across divisions um, is extremely important to, to our success. And so we've got, you know, one, one division has two districts in the park, one division has seven districts, one has five. You know, it's important for us probably to synchronize that a little bit so we can be more effective together as a, as a cohesive team of people working in the park towards similar goals, not not individual entities um, working, uh, doing a good job, but maybe not working in the best or most optimal organizational structure. Maybe I misunderstood you a little bit, but um, did I hear you say that you're looking at replacing some of these trailers with more permanent structures? That would, yes. I mean, the, a lot of these trailers have been uh, in place since the 70s, since the 80s. So. Uh, I would argue that even though trailer has a the notion of temporary, um, in some ways in the park service, there's no such thing as a, uh, a temporary trailer a lot of times. We say temporary and it ends up being there for 10 or 20 years. And so we've got those needs and we've got staffing uh, levels that we have to meet and they, we need to put them in the right housing. And so we would be looking at replacing 
uh, trailers with uh, better, more efficient, and more comfortable um, permanent housing. I'm going to move on to a different topic here. Um, the bison um, harvest has just concluded. Didn't quite get as many as the plan had called for in the fall. Um, weather probably had something to do with that. What challenges does that create for you now going into the summer? Well, because of the the the, the way the winter progressed, uh, our migration out of bison out of the park was um, delayed, and um, where we would normally start out bison operations earlier, we weren't able to start until later, and that includes <coughs> uh, the tribal hunt, and the tribal hunt did not start until later as well because bison didn't migrate outside of the boundary. Uh, I, I commend the uh, team for uh, facilitating about 400, uh, removal of about 450 bison. Um, and our target was six to 900. Uh, we established that target back in, in uh, November uh, through, and, and announced that at the IBMP meeting. I, um, I think that uh, what that probably means is that uh, like we've had in several years past, uh, we've had years where we've, I mean, two, three years ago, the bison and herd numbers were 5,500 in this park. Uh, the park was managing for a declining population of bison. Uh, that meant they were taking out substantial numbers of bison each year. Um, our goal was to try to manage to a range of bison that was somewhere between 34, 3,500 in the winter number to about 4,200 or so um, post-calving. Uh, because we didn't hit that six to 900 number, that probably means a larger operation next year. Uh, we're continuing to work. You know, you've got, as you know, um, the three kind of, the three ways that we're, we're kind of managing the herd right now. And rem let's remember that bison are really the only, only species that we're constraining uh, and that we're actively managing from the standpoint of um, hunting, allowing tribal hunting outside the park. Um, we're obviously sh shipping bison to slaughter still. And we're, you know, I commend Dan Wink for setting up uh, uh, and initiating the quarantine uh, process, uh, which we conti I continue to support. Uh, I think we're going to have to make a decision on quarantine here relatively soon as to whether or not uh, or how viable quarantine is moving forward. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're, we're spending a considerable amount of money every year to quarantine a relatively limited number of bison down at uh, Stevens Creek right now. Um, and we need to look at, uh, we've got 55 bison, bull bison, they'll be prepared to hopefully ship to Fort Peck later this year. That's on track. Uh, obviously we helped uh, and we supported the, the, the transfer of the five bison from Corwin Springs to Fort mm -hmm. Peck here recently uh, that APHIS did. Uh, and then we've got another 21 or 22 females that should be ready to go um, probably in uh, late 2021. That's good, but the reality is our quarantine capacity at Stevens Creek, Creek is maxed out. So we couldn't even put new bison into quarantine this year. And so we, we're looking at the cost benefit of that are the numbers that are being generated, which are actually relatively nominal. Symbolic, yes, important, yes. Um, it's in the startup phase, so to speak, still. Uh, but we've got to work with tribes, with APHIS, with the state, um, with other partners to determine uh, how we want to manage quarantine and can it be expanded, do we want to expand it at what cost, and absent that, uh, absent quarantine expanding and us being able to actually put the numbers through and establish a, a, a robust pipeline, um, I don't see any way out of, and at least in the short term, of continuing to send bison to slaughter. Uh, is, is as unfortunate as that is, and as much as I don't like to do that, no one does. Um, and so what I, would, what I am pleased about is uh, the amount of conversations and the types of conversations that we've had with the state, um, with uh, the tribes, I was at Fort Peck in December, uh, about how we can facilitate that pipeline, what that looks like. And there's a lot of people really interested in that, but that's complicated. It takes land, it takes money, it takes mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people participating that can't be just a sole park service venture. And so we'll, we'll continue to push very hard on, on quarantine um, and looking at viable options moving forward. Um, but a little bit of a unique year, back to your question, uh, because of the lateness of the migration 
and what that translates to probably next year is is a, a, a higher number both from the harvest standpoint and the shipment to slaughter and then we'll see what we can do between now and then as far as expanding quarantine. And does that create some PR problems for you then come next year? Sure, I'm sure it does. And how do you, how would you address that? How do you go about trying to deal, because that's another community and it's primarily driven by, by maybe a, a different kind of community than you have among other park users. I think people need to put in perspective, um, you know, we would love to not ship uh, bison to slaughter tomorrow. I mean, if I, if I could, if we can manage to uh, the number that we need to support um, a, a viable and genetically pure bison population uh, in this park, and like we do with other species, ultimately allow bison to migrate back and forth like elk do, like you know, wolves do, like other, other, other species do that we don't constrain. Um, I think that would be ideal. I think there's been good progress, even though it, at, it's microscopic progress, perhaps. Uh, when I sat in IBMP last November, <clears throat> I listened to conversations that I don't think would have occurred even a couple of years ago in relationship to tolerance zones, um, in relationship to um, the, the ability for bison both on the west side and the north side to migrate out of the boundary um, for tribes and for state hunters to, to hunt them as they do other species. Um, and, you know, I've been very impressed by uh, Governor Bullock and some of the actions that he's taken to facilitate not only expanding tolerance zones but also with the tribes and trying to facilitate help with the quarantine process. and. There's, difference, there's a difference of opinion out there on this. I mean, there's, there's, there's a political perspective, there's a social perspective, there's a biological, there's a disease perspective. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's complicated. There's a reason why we've been sitting in this framework that we work within now for the last 19 years, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's challenging. But I would argue that we've come, we've, we have come a ways, and I think progress can be made. It's not gonna be a light switch. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to say next year, hey, I can't stand sending bison to slaughter, I'm not going to do it. Uh, there's still a number that needs to be managed to, uh, we need to continue to work. And what I would ask advocacy groups who I appreciate their perspectives on this issue uh, is to help, help us solve these issues constructively um, through, through dialogue, through action, through education, through um, better understanding how to separate fact from fiction on on brucellosis transfer, understanding that uh, the livestock industry has a perspective. Um, others have a perspective. They think theirs is right. They think theirs is right. Um, there's a, you, we can't solve the issues uh, if we're not coming together and trying to look for those common denominators where we can solve problems over the long term. We're going to need to reframe this at some point. It's going to have to be reframed. I do think it's going to be easier given some of the things I just mentioned. I think there's good relationships being established right now. I mean, I've had very good conversations with the governor, with the governor's staff, with the, um, you know, the head of the Department of Livestock, with um, you know, any number of people um, in the tribes as well. But how do, we, how do we look for those common denominators that are gonna have the highest impact? Help us you know, successfully allow bison to migrate out continue to, to make efforts to reduce or eliminate uh, any potential for brucellosis transfer to, 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 um, to cattle, uh, support the tribal hunts, um, maintain a viable genetically pure population in Yellowstone. And um, I think we will get there, but it's not gonna be overnight. But it, you know, everybody working together is, is gonna be what helps it. And uh, I do pre appreciate the, the advocacy on both sides. I mean, I appreciate people's perspectives. At the end of the day, without that dialogue and without us understanding how to move forward and people being, being willing to give and take, maybe to try some things, try some things that maybe haven't been tried before, to pitch in and help uh, with whether it's expanding the quarantine process or you name it, um, then we'll sit right where we are. So 
let's figure out the best way to move forward with all, all of those stakeholders. It's really important. I want to move on just real quickly uh, to Wolves. Um, this late fall, late November, uh, when 926 was killed out uh, in Gardner, um, we heard Doug Smith on 60 Minutes on CBS, our, our network, get a little bit uh, upset and a little bit heated. He talked about um, um, trying to take at steps or actions that would uh, make the wolves more afraid of humans. Talked about using, uh, you know, cracker shots, loud shots from shotguns, rubber bullets, things like that. How do you feel about about some about taking that sort of action? So, Doug is the best in the world. I mean, he's he's just incredible. I mean, when I talk about the, the incredible staff here in Yellowstone, uh, he epitomizes that, and as does his team. And um, you know, there's an incredible amount of passion in regards to wolves, not only by Doug and, and the great crew here, but by our visitors, by our, um, our communities in many ways, um, from an economic perspective, from a um, viewing of wildlife perspective, um, from the standpoint of the ecosystem, health, uh, bringing wolves back, which has only been 20, what, 24, 25 years back into this ecosystem, has uh, substantially helped balance uh, something that was missing for a very, very long time. It was a critical, critical piece. The passion that people have for the wolves inside of Yellowstone, uh, you know, I think to what what Doug's saying there is the wolves are are wild animals. There's no question. The wolves are are probably one of the most watched and followed species in the park. No question. Because of that, there is some habituation that occurs. There's some level of comfort that, 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 that wolves have uh, with humans being somewhat in close proximity. You know, it might be a mile away looking through a scope, it might be closer. Um, and so I think it makes it difficult when, you know, a, a wolf then leaves the boundary of Yellowstone and sees a human. And what Doug's saying is, you know, because we've allowed um, the wolves to really not be afraid of humans in the park and, and whenever they see a human they're just being watched and they leave and they can get shot and killed. Uh, is there actions that we should take to make them less comfortable in the park around humans and therefore they would be less comfortable around humans outside of the boundary? I've listened to a lot of briefings on, on wildlife. I'm still learning. Uh, I do support taking some actions uh, to ensure that um, whether it be wolves or other species, that they, they maintain uh, their wildest form possible and that we're not um, facilitating um, a, a lessening of that wildness just because of the habituation or the proximity to um, our visitors who are enjoying them. So there's a balance in there somewhere. I don't know exactly what the right technique is. I would suggest that Doug doesn't know quite yet what that might look like. Um, but we will, we will continue to look at that as, as something that we may, we may take action on in the future, and that could come in different forms. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid our time is up. I promised to talk about some of your experiences, so I'm going to invite you to stay, and we'll put that on our digital uh, sides so that people can have that as a bonus. Right. Thank you very much for joining us today. You've been watching Face the State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.